Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of jQuery Portland, and I hope everyone is enjoying themselves so far. This session is called Straight from the Source, and I'm going to go over why it's important as developers to read source code from time to time and how it makes our development skills better. I'm Rashane. I'm from New York. I'm a full stack developer at the Label League with a passion and focus on JavaScript, and I also write Ruby in our Rails application. Brief summary about the Label League. We are a company that's focused on elevating the careers of Gen Y women through career content, events, and mentorships, all through our website. This is my handle, Copacetic Kid, where I tweet all the things I'm up to. Feel free to ping me here anytime if you have any questions after this. So a show of hands. Who here reads source code when there's a problem in your app you're building, or you just want to understand certain things better in JavaScript? Oh, OK. That's good hands. Um, we make use of all these great JavaScript frameworks or libraries like jQuery, Backbone, Underscore. The list goes on and on, but we don't read the source code sometimes often enough just to level up our skills. So I read code, not just when I'm working on a new feature or fixing a bug in my company's application or my own projects. I found that one key thing in my learning process that helps my development skills improve over time is that I'm exposed to new techniques and key problem-solving skills that sometimes I'm looking for in challenging pieces of code to help me get better. And you should read code, too, if you're not already doing it. Not just the libraries, not just when the library, the framework, has no or poor, poor documentation. Sometimes it's just good to go through it and be curious about what you're using and why it's making your app be so much better. Skill acquisition. As developers, we're constantly learning new technologies, and our skills enable us to learn more as technology improves. So wouldn't you like to be an expert to intuitively know the right answer? Reading the source code from time to time is one step on that journey. We'll look at what it means to be a novice and what it means to be an expert at all, and all the stages in between of those. So these stage, stages that I'm going to go through are my opinions based on the Dreyfus model, that our abilities, attitudes, capabilities, and perspectives change according to our skill level. The Dreyfus model consists of five stages of learning that we go through, no matter what the field. And today, I'll be applying those particularly just to our JavaScript skills. So Keep in mind that depending on your area of focus within JavaScript, you may fall into different categories of this model for a certain area. So a novice. That can be someone that's new to programming, such as programming language, such as JavaScript, or they're new to programming in general, and they've decided to pick JavaScript as their first language. Novices need recipes. They don't know how to make mistakes. They don't know how to respond to mistakes. Sorry, they'll make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> Their immediate goal is just to get it to work. <laughs> providing the context-free, providing them rules in order to stay in line gives them the structure and the confidence in order to keep up with it. But this isn't scalable for them in the long run. As the rules will only get them started, they'll eventually hit a wall and want to break out and do something better next time. So an advanced beginner, that's someone who tries on their own, but they still have difficulty debugging. They hit a wall, so they probably go to Google or Stack Overflow. Then they apply the, the advice that they gained when they were a novice and use that in similar situations, but they still rely on an instructor or the internet or a friend to help them get through it. So someone who's reached the third stage is competent. At this stage, you can troubleshoot problems as well as tackle what you haven't faced before. You're no longer afraid or feeling too frustrated once you hit this wall now. Here, you no longer apply the trial and error approach to get your code to work, and you're actually taking the time to think through why it's breaking at this particular line. 
we all remember the feeling of arriving at this stage in a particular language that we use. And most developers, they'll feel empowered here, and, most, and hopefully most of them would want to advance their skill set after this, just not to be hitting a wall every time. Now at the fourth stage, you're proficient. You and, other, you and others consider your, you consider your JavaScript skills to be proficient. You're able to correct poor task performances you've written before in your app and revise accordingly. So next time you're not making the same mistakes in a method. Now you have the ability to understand and recognize when to apply certain rules or actions to a situation given the amount of time you've put in already. The ability to understand these rules to certain situations is one key that makes you become an expert eventually. Proficient developers have enough experience to know from experience what's likely to happen next. When it doesn't work out that way, they know what needs to change. It's apparent to them which plans need to be discarded and which, what needs to be done next. At the fifth and final stage, experts are the primary sources of knowledge and information in a given field. They are the ones who are continually looking for better methods and, way, and better ways of doing things. They have a vast body of experience and they can tap into that at just the right context. As experts, they know the difference between irrelevant details and the important details, perhaps not only on a conscious level, but the experts know which details to focus on and which ones can be safely ignored. So you're probably wondering now, what is the value in reading source code? What can I get out of it? Some may say it sounds boring, that it's not for me. I'm just going to keep writing code and ignoring what's, what better code may be out there that can make me better. But there are only things that have gotten you so far. And here are some things that could change your mind if you're not already reading source code. Common idioms. You may see these across projects and be like, wow, that's a nice chunk of block of code right there that I probably would have taken me years to figure out how to write. And you remember that and hopefully want to use that next time. You specifically learn how JavaScript developers write JavaScript. You can go through popular libraries like jQuery or read popular blog posts where other developers have broken down sections of open source JavaScript projects such as Paul Irish's 10 Things I Learned from jQuery Source. If you still feel like you're not ready, I would recommend that as a good starting point for you to see what the value is in reading source code so you can be convinced. Don't just read good code. Reading bad code is great. So you, can see, so you get to see the poorly designed interfaces and learn from them. So if you want to find bad code, I would just search on GitHub. Um, Go to projects that are starred less, or just randomly search at languages you may find interesting or you're already using. And then leave comments about the code. Get engaged. Maybe put, make a pull request and show them something they can do better. You're always breaking down code. It's a good practice to break down code, especially even when it's not pertaining to your work, because you'll always have to work with somebody else's code whether it's your company, your freelance project, or you're contributing to other source projects, it's just a good way to keep your mind open to different techniques and building those problem-solving skills that we need each day. From reading code, you'll get insight into the limitations. You'll understand, depending on the project that you're looking at or probably using, you can learn where you can and can't rely on the code. For example, if you're using a third-party software, it can save you some trouble when you encounter unexpected behavior. Um, for instance, we use Devise at Label League for authentication, and we actually had to go through their source code to make sure um, the remember me function was working, because to the user, it seemed like it wasn't working, but from a backend perspective, it was fine. So it was more about fixing our UI to make it more clear to them that you were remembered when you left the web, web page and came back. When you read code, you should actually make some time to do it, like maybe block off an hour. You want to be committed to this if you are. And if you're not sure where to start or you're afraid you're into getting in over your head, I would suggest going to local meetups. That's what I've done. Started a group where we 
were meeting on Saturdays and we were picking different open source projects to go through. We started with D3, that was our first one, and we looked at some of the, I can't remember which function it is at the time, but we, we only looked at about three functions because the D3 library is really big. So we picked certain sections that interest us to just break down that and see the mechanics behind that. And it's, it was actually really good because we learned about um, shifting bits in JavaScript that you probably would have never thought you could do. So here are some things to keep in mind for the process when you begin reading source code. You want to keep it small. If you wanted to know more about the jQuery source, don't just go to the page and download the uncompressed version and start reading it like a newspaper. You'll get overwhelmed really fast or bored and call it quits. Whatever you pick to read, like I said, just try to section off time or pair with somebody or even leave comments, make a blog and start saying, oh, I read this here. I'm not really sure how it's implemented. Can someone help me understand why it's working this way? So have a goal each time you read it. Um, one thing you can start off with is jQuery. Um, I would suggest going through the selectors, because that's a common thing that everyone does. They traverse the DOM. I would see how you would do that if jQuery didn't exist, and, or if you needed to write your own library to do that. Picking a starting point. So when you have a project that you're using, you may want to know more about the particular library. You're probably just making simple calls, but you're not really sure what's going on behind that. That could be a good starting point, or you can just pick something you're thinking about learning, if you're interested in Angular or Backbone, or just picking something that interests you that you may not have plans to use, you just are curious about how does, how does someone write a library or a framework of that nature? What are the mechanics that goes into that? So before I started reading source code, everything I was writing was a mess. I started learning JavaScript, learned the fundamentals, come from a C++ background, and then I was taking a web course at college. And then in that course, they more focused on jQuery. So it was really great. We were doing things, we were making animations and stuff like that. So when I had a web project for the final, I decided I'm gonna make use of jQuery after a um, few of the topics we went over. We touched on um, Ajax a little bit. So I dared to make a web app that used some APIs. So I chose Foursquare and Google Maps. It was just a mashup to take some data from Foursquare um, for locations you were looking for. Say you were, you're in Portland, it, had, it was geolocation based and you search for pizza. It would just, based on your location, bring back about 10 to 15 results of pizza populate them on the Google Maps, and show you some more data that you weren't getting at the time from Google Maps, like how many people have been there, maybe certain reviews, check-in counts, stuff of those nature. This was more data-driven than presentation-wise. So the point of the app was just to learn how to use Ajax and APIs, which I did. But it was com designed completely bad. Everything that was happening after a user inputted information was mainly in one chunk of uh, my function, and it looked like this. You don't have to worry about the source code, but the fact that everything was just happening in one chunk was like where I started from. So the code above, it just, it triggers all the information to display after someone has searched for something. And then after this, I was getting good feedback because I demoed it at a couple of meetups after I got something to work, and then and then um, people were like, oh, this is great. We really like your concept. Um, you know, great feedback to go back and improve. But I was just thinking, I don't even want to touch this again because it was so hard to do. <laughs> but I was just learning for the first time. So that made me realize I actually want to learn more about just JavaScript and better practices so I can go back and iterate on my apps faster. So to quote Angelina, who's speaking later today, jQuery is like a gateway drug. <laughs> And that is exactly what I did for that application. I was running high on how easy it was to just get things done. I was so wrapped up that I just let everything happen in that one function, and all my code was tightly coupled on any given line. There was either presentation, data, user interaction, or application state happening. 
which made me want to just not bother doing um, a second version to that app. So I took the time to do some self-improvement. I was like, before I go back and iterate on this app, I want to get better at just JavaScript. So I put that on hold, and I decided that I needed to learn more about the fundamentals. So during that time, I was reading source code. I was seeing how to break my functions out smaller so that by the time I arrived at my current company, Levo, I was given my first feature. I was just working on bugs at the time. So with the guidance of our CTO, I was in charge of a new feature that we were doing, and now I was able to apply some of the new structures I had learned. After finding articles on the internet, I was able to separate out function. So now I was in a new era of thinking. Um, mainly when I was starting to search, I was coming across videos um, around the time of last year's um, SF conference for jQuery. So I watched most of the videos, but it was Rebecca Murphy's video about beyond the DOM, same structures for JS apps that stood out. That was exactly where I was at the time, not knowing what was going on in my project. So I watched the video, took some notes, then I went to her blog, went to her GitHub page, and then I've invested time looking into also the tools she mentioned. So not only was I learning about structuring code from her talk, I began to invest time in those tools. So I started off with one that I was curious about at the time, which was Back.js. I was Googling everything there was on, at the time last year, made a couple of to-do apps, and was getting the concepts, reading through the online documentation just on the main page, but things still weren't clicking. I was understanding that I needed to separate my logic in different places and use callbacks and things of those nature, but I just couldn't get my new Backbone app up and running. So I went to the source code, like I did when I was first reading, first learned about uh, Rebecca Murphy and I went to her, her pages. And I used those to fill in the gaps that were missing for me. This is a picture of the annotated source. And what I really like about the way um, Jeremy Ashkenash does his stuff, all, most of his projects have annotated source, like underscore. And the annotated source was much better than just reading the little snippets of functionality definitions he gave on the page. They were too high level, I guess, and not enough meat for me to really understand what was going on in things. So I just took the time to slowly read about models, for instance, were confusing to me at first. So I started there in the source code and then moved on to events of those nature. <laughs> so I accomplished that first goal. I was understanding Backbone.js so I can use it in my projects, mainly at side projects at the time, and then eventually helping um, label switch over to using Backbone in our main app. And then not only was it making things clearer for me, I was finding myself discovering new techniques and styles that in my JavaScript writing that I wasn't doing months before, that I was actually just now impl implementing at Levo, that I hadn't, wouldn't have come across probably as fast if I wasn't reading so many posts on the internet about code organization and architecture. So I walked away learning not just about um, Backbone, more about JavaScript and how to keep improving in the long run. Um, so next time you get stuck, don't just try Googling or going on to Stack Overflow. First for your solution, just try going to the source code for the problem first and look there if it's a function that's giving you trouble or if you're just curious about what actually is going on under the hood. It just makes everything a whole much better and it helps you in the long run to even write your own applications. Thank you for coming out. Are there any questions? Okay, see that thing. Yes? <laughs> How do I feel about that? I actually, it, I've seen it work. Um, so when I first started the meetups in New York um, for people to pick a project and we just go through source code, because me and another friend were like, we should do that. Like, it's something we know we should be doing, but we're not doing. So we started off with the V3, and 
about three to four people who were still relatively new to JavaScript came because they were curious, not only about the library, but just about JavaScript in general. And two people stood out as far as like they really learned a lot that day, and it made them actually want to go. They were asking us what are just great fundamental books of JavaScript that they can go back to so they can understand better what was happening in code, because me and my friend were more leading that, those workshops as far as like when we were breaking down the code and what we thought was happening on each line and you know, going back and finding where they're really calling a function from. So it may sometimes go over people's heads, but they actually are like, wow, I need to come back and like learn more JavaScript, then I can come and understand what this library is doing better. Yes? Mm -hmm. Right. No, yeah, 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 I, I get it. You're instead of you go to function A, and you end up all the way down at F because of all the things that are going on. Function, right? Uh, yeah, those. Hmm. I, I've had that happen, and it, it's made me just like, I. It always makes me think I need to go back to the core of JavaScript. <laughs> Um, um, that's usually where I just go back to and like, okay, I got to learn more about promises or callbacks or things of those nature because they're most of the time they're doing things I've heard of but haven't seen. So I actually go research. Oh, that's what that actually looks like and does. So yeah, you end up doing more research than figuring out what's going on with the function. But that's still, I still found that very valuable. Yeah, I agree with the frustrating. <laughs> okay, I think that's it. Thank you.